got to stand up strong Take the truth about themselves To understand what went wrong I know we can find a way I know we can find a way I know we can find Welcome to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson. Um, I'm going to introduce myself and then introduce the guys that are here with me today. Uh, they are from the uh, organization, the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. And uh, I am the founder and president of Bond. And our purpose is to rebuild the family by rebuilding the man. We realize that nothing is going to change in the black community and in our country until men come back to order. Uh, men are very weak today, and especially black men. Most men, whether black or white, but especially black men. Black men are, black men are like women. They're very insecure. They're very doubtful. They're shy. They, uh, they can't make good decisions. They look to others to take care of them instead of them taking care of themselves. Uh, they are afraid of their woman. The average black man cannot deal with a black woman. Uh, he's afraid of her. He's intimidated by her. He's like a little child with her. So what we're doing is trying to get him to understand how that happened and uh, how to overcome it. And uh, so we are dealing with those issues. We have entrepreneur program, mentor program, kind of all kind of stuff going on. But we believe that if a man should wake up, he can then be the leader of his own life. He doesn't need other people to lead him. Uh, um, a good example is Proposition 209, the Affirmative Action Bill, um, anti-affirmative action bill. We, I am in favor of that. I'm so glad. I, I'm really jumping up and down that Proposition 209 passed. And now black people will be forced to stand up on their own two feet Stop begging, stop wimping and whining, and asking someone to give them something. It's a disgrace to, here it is, 1996, and we're still uh, wimping and whining and begging. Thank God that Proposition 209 is, have, have made sure that blacks can no longer beg. But if they beg, they're not going to get. Hallelujah. And also, uh, we're going to be talking about Proposition 209. We're going to be talking about the black leaders in the community. As you know, many of you may know, is that we are asking Maxine Waters to resign. And there are many people jumping on board to see to, her, to it that she resign. We'll be talking about that later in the program as well. She, she's been in office for at least 20 years or so, and she's clearly taken advantage of black people. She used them for her own personal gain. And not only her, Cecil Murray from AME Church and Jesse Jackson and NWCP, all of those guys, uh, uh, pretty awful people. But we're going to talk about that. But right now we're going to talk about affirmative action. I'm going to introduce, intro, introduce you to some of the guys from the uh, organization. On my left, far left, is Billy. Hi, Billy. Hi. Uh, Marcus. How you doing, Jesse? AJ. AJ is uh, my uh, my co-host on my radio talk show. Uh, we have a radio talk show as well, and, and AJ is my co-host on the uh, radio show. And we're going to be giving out the phone number during this uh, program so you can call the office and get more information about the radio show and other things that we're doing. This is AJ. Uh, this is Clinton. Clinton uh, is from Alabama. He's a southern boy. Can I say boy? Sure. <laughs> he, he's a just just boy, a little bit. A country boy, and he loves the truth, and he's beginning to change. And we have a, a white boy on here who got in on the affirmative action program. <laughs> 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 we had to have one, so we let this guy in. This is Pat Rooney. Token. Yeah, the token, token. Uh, white boy. Uh, he's even cutting his hair like us. <laughs> Why is it that white people want to be black? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, I don't know. A lot of black people want to be white, too, it seems to. Uh, uh, that's because we're so unhappy. You know, <laughs> I say that. <laughs> I'm looking for Michael Jackson. I need to put that out. Uh. The thing of Michael Jackson. And the reason I'm looking for him because I am sick and tired of being white. I mean black. So I'm going to take me some of those pills so I can be white. I'm embarrassed to be black any longer. So we're working on that. How did you guys feel about uh, Billy? Affirmative action. Were you in favor of affirmative action or against? I was against affirmative action. I can't hear you. Action. I'm sorry? I was against affirmative action. Why is that? How old are you? I'm 23. You're 23. Yeah. And why were you against affirmative action? Uh, I didn't believe that. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> I didn't believe that. Uh, I still can't hear you. <laughs> I didn't believe that, that <laughs> it... Um, that that it any longer had um, had any positive um, was going to really help anything. You know, I didn't think that it was going to have any type of positive impact any longer. Really, and had it had any positive effect at all? Effect at all? It's it's questionable. I think it is questionable that it you know it it. I think it had at least some type of, of negative effect in that, in that, uh, you know, it, it didn't, I mean, we weren't, black people were not working, you know, at the same level as um, a, a white person or other people. Um, and, uh, so you know you think that we'll be able to work at the same level level as whites and others? Well, well I mean, is it we in school, have? in schools and stuff like that where that, you know, you didn't have to be as good to get into college or whatever. <coughs> and um, and I, I think that's had a, a negative, a negative impact as far as other people, you know, as far as uh, other people looking at you, us, as equals, you oh, know, in a job place or, or in schools. I mean, I don't think it. I don't think it. You know, I don't think it lets you. Us have the respect that we. Yeah. Should have. How about how how do you feel about affirmative action, Mark? I really don't know what you think about it. I never heard you mention that before. Well, I've got a lot of friends that are still in college right now, and personally, I think that there has always been opportunity for blacks to be in college. I don't know if it was necessary, per se, because a lot of them that are in school are arguing, if we take this away, then blacks are not going to be able to get into the colleges anymore, and I, I really don't think that's true. I know a lot of my friends weren't exactly lining up to go to college. It's just simply that this is what you do after you get out of high school. It's not because they really wanted to get an education, per se. and. Um, I don't really agree with it because I think that um, personally I think I don't know how we're going to be respected as a people if, since they seem to be claiming that we want to be respected as a people if we always say that we're just as good as everybody else we just need this much I can beat you in this race I'm just as good as you I just need a head start um, I, 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 and I've talked to some of my friends who are in college and they agree with it but yet they feel that if you take affirmative action away, you're going to take away their way and they won't be able to make it. And there's always been scholarships, there's always been grants, there's always been things that you could use to get into colleges. Yeah. So. And so they, are they afraid they won't get in because the white man will let them in or they're not smart enough to get in? They're unwilling to work to get in. I'm not really sure what the objective is because it seems to me that they've never really researched any other method to get into college. It's like they don't really know how to get into college and they think that affirmative action was the only way to get into college. As mm -hmm. if you don't have affirmative action, they won't be able to go to school, and that's not true. How do you, how do you feel about it, uh, co-host? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm totally against it, to be honest. Are you? Um, the way I see it is that we really don't need affirmative action. It shouldn't have come up to begin with, because it, all it is is just a handout. That's all, just a handout. And so how old are you? <coughs> well, how old are you, Mark? 25. 25. You're 22 years of age. And you don't feel that we need, but what about the white man? Isn't the white man holding us back? That's just an excuse that many, many of blacks have used for ages now. The way I see it is 
<laughs> you know, um, or actually, in fact, just today at, at my work, I was speaking with, with a, a, a couple of co workers, and we had got on the discussion about 209. And what was brought up was that, well, seeing how I'm black, how can I be against it? You know, and I just told the, uh, the person that told me that was like, well, the way I see it is, like I said, it's a handout. And if I'm if I'm going to get a job, I want to get it because I'm skilled and qualified, not because of my skin color. Yeah. And then what this lady had came back and replied was, OK, well, yeah, but now pretty much if this were to happen, if since it since the affirmative action is gone now, um, now. <coughs> it'll be a lot easier in order for us to see where racism is and all that. And basically, the, the way I see it is, is if someone is going to be like that and discriminate against me, then, you know, I don't want to work for that company. Yeah, absolutely. I go out and own my own company. Pat, what, do, what do you think about affirmative action? You better be careful. As, as a white man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never been for it. I mean, I, I just saw it as another way for the, uh, you know, the basic free enterprise system to be under attack. You know, the government's always looking for a way to get involved with business and to try to try to monkey around with it. And there's always been people that have hated this country and don't like the freedoms that we have here and want to uh, kind of burrow in from underneath and mess it up, uh, tear it down from below. And I just see that as a, it may have in the beginning had some function, but clearly I haven't seen any real function for it over the last few years that, it, that it's been around. So. As a white man, do you feel discriminated against uh, uh, with or by affirmative action? People that are maybe getting ahead, not because they qualify, but because of color or their sex? Um, I mean, there's always, when you see somebody uh, uh, and there's affirmative action program and they're black or uh, woman or some other minority, there's always a question mark around them. You know, did they get there because of their merit or did they get there because of affirmative action? Really? A lot of times you don't know. So as a white man, do you get special uh, priv privileges from white people that I, as a black man, don't get? Let's say you and I went to a company. <coughs> mm -hmm. We both had the same qualification. Do you think that they would hire you over me because you're a white male? I don't know. I mean, probably not. I'm sure there's some cases where it would happen. I think, you know, people tend to hire their own kind. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that happens sometimes. You have a white man that would be more inclined to hire a white person. If the black, if there was a black person that was a head of a company, he may be more inclined to hire a black than a white. I mean, I, I think that's the way human nature is a little bit. Really? And let me ask this. Before we go to break, let me ask you this. What do you think about black people when you see us wimping and whining and banging all the time? What goes through your mind as a white man? Well, when you say wimping and whining and begging, I don't see it exactly like that. I see it like uh, what it looks like to me is black people getting real angry about the situation and <laughs> saying we're going to march through the streets and we're going to tear down this and that. And it starts to get you defensive. You start to put up your, your walls because you start seeing, when you say wimping and whining, I see it more as a, a, they get more in your face about it. And you hear a lot of activists, black activists say, we're not going to put up with this, we're going to take to the streets. And they start sounding real violent about it. So it gets you kind of to put up some walls about it and say, hey, you know, i got to protect myself. So I, I don't think it helps the situation to see those people acting the way they do in the, in the streets and all that. It doesn't help white people uh, be any more inclined to want to say, hey, I'll work with you. You know, let's work together. When you see that, you just want to kind of say, forget it. I don't want to deal with you. Yeah. I think it hurts the cause. Did you vote? Uh did you vote? Yeah, I voted 4209. 4209. When we come back from this uh, break, we're going to talk to Clinton uh, and get his opinion on uh, Proposition 209. We'll be back in a moment. Feel free to jump in when you guys want to. Yeah, I was going to do that too. Yeah. Okay, we are back. My name is Jesse Peterson, and we're talking about um, affirmative action. We're talking about the black community. We're talking about men. We are talking about a whole bunch of different things here. And the men that are here today, uh, they are from the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. And uh, we are a nonprofit national organization with the purpose of rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. And uh, just before we went to break, Clinton uh, wanted to talk about affirmative action. Do you believe in affirmative action? No, I'm, I'm totally against it. Oh, let me just say this. We did invite the opposition. There were people that were supposed to come who were in favor, blacks from different colleges and areas, who were in favor of affirmative action, but 
they uh, refused to come on. They were afraid to take on the challenge. Let me, can I jump yeah. in there? Let me say we talked to three uh, junior colleges in the area. We talked to the uh, pro uh, 209 people. I mean, I'm sorry, the against 209 people. Uh, we talked to a whole number of people, and uh, we did get a few that did say they would come on, but not a single one showed up. Okay. Yes, Clint. Um, as I was saying, I, I, I'm really totally against it. I mean, because number one, affirmative action was basically uh, <laughs> basically affirmative action was, was for the black man anyway, but was for the black people, and it was kind of taken away from us by the white women and the Mexicans and other yeah, people that came into right. it, you know. So it was kind of good that it, that it didn't pass so the black people can finally stand up for themselves and, and, and be strong black men that, that we should be without any handouts or any, anything given to us. The biggest problem is, is the, the leaders that we have today are, are so weak to a weak person has no other choice but to follow them because that's all we have. We have no more Martin Luther Kings here. All we have is people who want to follow them and, and use him as a like a stepping stone for it or something. You know, just yeah. just use him to, to do it. So that's all we have to look up for. So we have no other choice but to fall weak to what they say because we have no other people to look up to. Let me ask you this. Yeah. I want to kind of comment with he was talking about one of the things I want to say about 209 is that we, uh, or before that, with affirmative action, I looked at it. Well, who's benefited from this? Yeah. I mean, I don't remember, and maybe I didn't know, but I don't remember my friends growing up, you know, can't wait to get to college, you know, begging at the college <laughs> doors trying to get in. It was more like, you know, if somebody else is going to pay for it, why not? You know, if you had to go and get a job and pay for it. Like, I went to a community college, you know, I had to work because. I decided to do something different than what my parents wanted me to do. I'm thinking when you work for it and you go and put in the effort, then you'll find a way to make that happen. It was simply that this was an easy thing and we're giving this out, why not? You know, we'll just go out to this kind of college and I don't think that's a good way to go through school. You know, uh, uh, another thing that I noticed about black people, not all of them, let me just say not all blacks are crazy, just many. <laughs> <laughs> but the one, what, the one thing that I noticed is that we don't think for ourselves. You know, we have people like uh, uh, Maxine and Waters and the NAACP and Diane Watson and Black Caucus, Louis Farrakhan, and 99.9% and .9 of the black ministers and others telling us as black people that we need programs. You know, we need, we need the welfare. We need somebody to give us something. And we believe that without even thinking about what they're saying because these people that are offering us the program, they are not on those programs. Maxine is not a part of a welfare program. She's not a part of affirmative action. And, and Jesse Jackson, his kids go to the best schools in the country. Yes, you're right. They, do. They, they got their fathers in the home, their mother in the home. They go to the best school. They don't offer their own kids affirmative action program, but yet they offer that to us, and we go for it kind of without even questioning yeah, it or so even good, thinking about it. they're using it? Yep. I mean, once again, it's, it makes me a little upset to see somebody tell me that I mean, I think that I'm just as smart as anybody else. That's I can right. do whatever is required to make it happen. And for somebody to tell me, well, you can't do it unless you have this is a little bit disrespectful. It is. And, and I, I don't, I, I know that black people can do it. I know that there's nothing wrong with them. Now, I know somebody else looking outside in might be able to believe this because they don't know what's going on. But I know there's- They're brainwashed. No, they can't yeah, see clearly. There's nothing wrong with black people that they're just as capable of doing anything. Yeah. But basically, it all, falls, you can. it all falls back down to the leaders. If you have a weak man in the home, you're going to have a weak family. If you have a weak man leading the community, you're going to have a weak community. Yeah. And that's all we have. We have weak people leading, weak, weak black men leading black um, young men and if that's, that's calling case, us to be weak then what uh, affirmative action is not going to help man how is that going to help if that is what the real situation is that we really believe that that's what the situation is then no affirmative action is going to help mm -hmm. that situation and mm -hmm. i noticed too that uh most people are too in, in the black community they're too cowardly to stand up and you know and speak out about that or speak against it because of all the things that you have to go through your life is threatened you're called a nigger uh, Uncle Tom, a sellout, and so a lot of black people are afraid, you know, to speak out against that because of that retaliation mm -hmm. that come against you. But we gotta have some balls and do it anyway, <laughs> because people are suffering as a result of. Yeah. You know what? What's re becoming real clear to me right now is that this has nothing to do with black people at all. Yeah. The black people, like you've said many times, the black people are being used. 
that is clear as a bell to me because it, it has to do with just taking a whole group of people and, and controlling them. Yeah. And I'll give you an example of this. Now, now that it's been so successfully done against the blacks, blacks vote about 90% liberal Democrat, right? That's a shame. It, it is. Not blacks, over 90% or about 90% of blacks vote democratically, vote for the Democratic Party. I mean, that alone doesn't make sense. Everybody don't think alike. So how is it that you got a whole nation of black folks thinking alike? That itself is crazy. But what they've done now is they've, they've successfully done this against the blacks, and now they're moving on to the Hispanics and Mexicans. Yeah. The, the biggest voting block now is becoming Mexican. I was reading in the LA Times today. They're taking the same tactics that were used against the blacks and putting them to the Mexicans for what? For what purpose? It's like Bill Clinton in the election got all these people to, even criminals, to come up here and vote you know, uh, and become citizens because he knows that eight out of ten of them are going to automatically vote for him. Yeah. So it's a big game to use people. Well, allegedly criminals. We don't know for sure. Well, we don't have any. Let's say allegedly, but yeah. but it's pretty good evidence <laughs> for it. Yeah. Also, um, um, I lost my thought. I was gonna say something else about the black folks. But I forgot. I know. I think myself, Martin Luther King, is turning over in his grave. <laughs> if if he can see the people that that's leading this this um, country now leading the, the community of black people and, and is trying to betray him. I'm, is trying to be um, uh, an idol like he was. You know, if, if he can just see it, he would be disgusted, I think, to see the people that's leading him, tell him to hate, hate white people. The, the white man is holding you back, you know, and it's, I yeah. just don't understand it. Yeah. This, is, also, this is a sad situation. Oops, I to cut you off. Oh, that's all right, yeah. co-host. <laughs> If I can bring up that uh, incident about uh, about the CIA bringing the crack cocaine into the oh, yeah. the neighborhoods and all that, yeah. when you think about it, she knew about this for a long, mm -hmm. long time, but she just decided to wait till election time to bring it up, and so pretty much she can kind of rally people behind her. Who is she? Uh, Maxine Waters. Oh, that, yeah. that is one thing that I noticed that there are a lot, I mean a lot of people that will pretty much use black people, or actually people in general, but a high percentage of blacks. Homosexuals use them. Uh, National Organization of Women Who Hate Men Use Blacks. OJ does. OJ. Uh, uh, anytime you want to, uh, the uh, ACLU who hate America, anytime you want to find a group of people to use to get your agenda across, just go into the black community and tell them, we love you, I love you, and I don't want anyone to discriminate against you. So here I am. And, and, and blacks are so silly, they just fall for it. But they just fall for it because the man said he loved him. How come it's so easy to follow wrong and not easy to follow right? Good question, because they're brainwashed. Anytime you believe a lie, then you can be controlled. And the lie that has been told to black people for 30 years, 30, it started in the early 60s. Prior to that, we were doing better. We had our own black universities. We had family. We had jobs. We had one another. We were doing well. But when the civil rights movement came in, that's when the whole brainwashing technique began. And those leaders, those wicked leaders, began to tell blacks that you can't make it, it's the white man holding you back, follow me. And the minute that they believe that, then they lost sense of consciousness, and now they can only believe the lie. You could tell black people that the white man is putting chick, uh, poison in uh, Jim Dandy's fried chicken, and they'll believe it. I mean, we had chicken every day, nobody died from it, but they'll believe it. Simply because they say that the white man is doing it. That's how brainwashed we are. And if you look at your own personal life, if a person can get you to react to them, if they can get you to believe a lie, then they got control of you. Look yes, at, let's look at the man and woman relationship, for example. I know a lot of guys who are uh, involved with women. They're having sex out of wedlock and doing all kinds of stuff. And the way the woman controls them, she gets him to feel good about himself. You know, you're a wonderful man, you're so handsome, you're just good in bed, everything is great right. about you. Yes. Then the guy feel all oh, good, oh, I can do it, right on. She got control of him. And then when he doesn't want to do what she wants him to do, first of all, she take away the sex, and then she tell him, you're no good. You're just a lazy black, nothing, no good. Now he's angry, and she still has control of him. What we got to learn is to not react to the system, not react to the world, and in that way, they won't have control of you. I understand how blacks think. I know how they feel. I used to be that way, too. I yeah. used to follow those same people. I have yeah. a question about affirmative action to you. Do you think that it had any purpose at all? Because I know a lot of people will argue, in the beginning, it seemed like a good idea. It opened up some doors that ordinarily would not have been opened up. But um, 
I think what a lot of people are angry about is that it doesn't really seem to hold its purpose now in 1990, if ever at all. You know, the uh, the intent of affirmative action was to help blacks because they had been in slavery. Mm-hmm. So it should help us to come out, open up some doors, and kind of let us in there. Mm-hmm. I personally don't think we needed that. That was a mistake, too, because any time you give anybody something, they're not going to develop the character. They, The more you give, the more they want. Mm-hmm. And the reason I don't think that it was good for us because I grew up on a plantation my grandparents worked for the white man and they never taught us to hate they taught us to work and as a result we were able to do for ourselves Mm -hmm. and the law were against us at that time but yeah we was able to make it and so by giving us anything at all it takes away the opportunity to develop character but it was for us but because we were so weak and blind we allowed the homosexuals to jump on board and everybody else so the white women ended up benefited from benefiting from it and we didn't get too much from it at all so and also, I think, if I can say something, yes, um, you can. <laughs> is that one question that I've always had on my mind is, how can somebody who wants affirmative action, how can they sit there and say that hey, yeah, that I want the same rights as somebody else, and here I am wanting to be equal as somebody else, but how how can they be equal if they're accepting a handout? That's right. You see, absolutely. It doesn't work these, that way. If if these people can pretty much you know rise up to the occasion, so can you. There's nothing in the world saying, hey, you can't be successful, you can't have a, your own business, you can't be rich. There's nothing or nobody stopping you. Absolutely. Only thing is all up here. People don't want to go. The true intent anyway of these kind of programs. I mean, to to like weaken people. I mean, you know what I mean. It's like it's like it seems to like to weaken people. To weaken people. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like a it's like a cocaine dealer. Mm. What it does, they give you the cocaine. Give, the cocaine dealer give you some free cocaine. Mm. He draws you in, and then once you're screwed up, he come back and save you. Right. So you constantly need him, and that's what the program do. Mm-hmm. You know, we're out of time already. Uh, we're here every Monday night, so if you just tune in, uh, you miss this program, you can call the station, and uh, we will. Uh, they will replay it for you. Also, if you want more information about the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny Bond, you can call us at our 800 number which is uh, 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-2663. And I'll see you next week. All right, welcome to the program. My name is Jesse Peterson. I am the uh, founder and president of the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. And our purpose is to rebuild the family by rebuilding a man. We are a national organization uh, headquartered out of Los Angeles. And we will be giving the uh, phone number in the middle of this program, so be sure to tune in. Uh, we're kind of talking about everything. We're doing a three-part series here, and we're talking about affirmative action. As you know, we just voted on Proposition 209, and I think many of us are very happy that uh, the program is now gone and blacks can prove themselves by standing up and earning their way. We can now hold our head up high and gain that respect, develop that character that Dr. King spoke about. We shall be judged by the context of our character and not our color. This is a perfect way to do it. We're talking about the family. Uh, We invited uh, others here to discuss uh, affirmative action and the black community, but they refused to come on. So uh, the guys here today is from the uh, organization, from Bond. So we're going to be talking about different issues. So you may want to tune in. You've never heard... Uh, anything like this. We're the only organization uh, that is dealing with the truth, the real truth. We've been lied to for so long in the churches. Uh, we even have churches like uh, uh, First AME Church with Reverend Caesar Murray passing out condoms in the church. We're not doing anything about that. We've been destroyed by the leaders, Maxine Waters and Jesse Jackson and others. We've been made a fool. We've been just literally made a fool of of, and so we're making a change. Um, we have guys here, so we're going to talk about, uh, you know what I want to talk about tonight? We can talk about anything, but um, um, black men and, and what is the problem with us? Uh, Clint, um, is there a problem with black men? Yes, that's, that's a big problem with us. And can you take your hand away from your mouth? Yes. Your <laughs> and, and what is the problem? Um, How old are you, Clint? 24. 24. Yeah. And how do you know there's a problem with black men? Because I know that we're, we're very weak to a certain extent, to, well, not to a certain extent, to a very, very high extent. In what way? 
um, with with women in um, taking control of our families, in standing up, running our families. Um, um, Let me just say this to you. Many people watching the program are going to say, well, he's just saying that because he heard Jesse say it. How do you know that? that I mean, do you know for yourself that that's true? Are you like that? or Have you been like that? Or, oh, yes, how, I have. You, I was very much like that. I, I was, was very weak. And what brings me back to it is, is um, talking about Proposition 209, how... When I was back home, from I'm from Alabama, if you didn't know. Um, <laughs> everybody, my parents, my father would always tell me no. Um, I was kind of confused of, of how should I go vote at the polls. And they was always just just go to the polls and vote Democrat all the way. So I just always <laughs> thought, you know, okay, well, I'm Democrat. But until I, I really came to Bun and realized that it's not necessarily um, um, because you're a black man, you're poor, and you're you um, down on yourself, you know. It, it pretty much showed me how to to stand up and 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 walk strong for myself and and be the man that that I should have always been. So and I I realized that a lot of black people think that they are Democrats just because that they're black because of what their moms and and. Um, are you Democrat now? No. And why did you change over? Because that I, I'm I'm not about. Um, I'm not about the way that I, I was taught as a Democrat, as, as that you have to be Democrat because the white man is not going to give you anything, and, and um, um, you're just going to be basically a weak person. You know that that that's what a, a Democrat to me is. And so, are you are you weak now? Or? No, I, I've, I'm a lot stronger than I was before. Way way more stronger than I was before. Yeah. And how about you, AJ? Are you a Democrat? Uh, no, I'm not. You're not a Democrat? No. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. No, I'm not. <laughs> and were you a Democrat before coming to Bond? Um, actually, I wasn't really in, in the politics at all, to be honest. <laughs> oh, so you didn't vote or anything like that? I didn't that. do anything. You no. didn't? So you was, you've never been a Democrat or anything? No. And so do you vote now? Uh, Yeah, I do. You don't vote, and do you vote Democrat or Republican? Republican. And why is that? Well, because in a way, um, if you look at the views of the Democratic Party, I don't agree with their views, like one, on how they feel that homosexuals should have the same rights <laughs> as, <laughs> no, we know how, how homosexuals should have the same rights as, I guess, straight people, you want to call it, and, you know, just, it, 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 it's a bunch of stuff, a whole list. But really? AJ, you 20? 22. 22. So how do you know, do you know for yourself that this is true, or have you been brainwashed by us? <laughs> no, it, it's, <laughs> no, 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 it's just, I'm just looking at politics in general, you know, I'm I'm looking at each party, and that's one thing that I never did before. Was actually just looked at each party. Oh, I see. So. And would you consider yourself a weak man or strong? Um, I was weak at one time. I, I'm pretty much uprising out of the the weak man syndrome, if that's what you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still somewhat weak. Um, to an extent. And what extent? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but um. I would have to say that I am getting pretty headstrong. So tell me this, uh, uh, so that I would know. De de define a weak man. When you say weak man, what do you mean? A weak man would be somebody like, say, for instance, a guy that would depend on a female, like, a, like uh, I guess you can say, like his girlfriend, for her to treat you places, you know, to buy you things. Um, a weak man to me would be somebody that doesn't stand up for themselves. A weak man would be somebody that doesn't face up to their responsibilities. And were you like that? Um, yes, I was like that. And why were you like that? You no, know, just because I was kind of babied all the way up through my, like, uh, my kind of <laughs> <laughs> young years coming up. I was like that. You babied by who? Oh, uh, everybody. My family, my, my girl, my ex-girlfriend, I should say, and some people. Really? And why did they baby you? Um, I don't know. I guess I just had the kind of personality, you know, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, I don't know. It, uh, it, so, yeah. But I can I can agree with some of what what he's saying because I mean, but when you kind of when you want to specify on, on um what causes a weak man, I think one weak man would cause another one, and it was starts by a weak father. You know, I mean, if your father's weak, ninety nine point nine percent of the time you're going to be weak. So was your dad weak? Yes, he he was weak. Uh, yeah, and and it caused me to be to take up with my my mother ways or the 
rather than my father ways. So what is the evidence to you that your dad was weak? How, how can a, I mean, we all know it, but how can a, a son or a daughter know that their father's weak? I mean, what is the evidence? Because I can see the difference. I can see how my mom um, kind of turned me against my father. Um, and as in when I was back, back in Alabama, I was just um, totally in, in agreement with her. Everything that she would say against him was the truth. But now I look back at it and I realize that he was, was really, he, it wasn't as bad as she, as she was saying. But she had so much control over me and her words were so controlling. And, well, a woman's word is very controlling anyway. But her words were so controlling that it just totally took over me to, to kind of turn against me. Really? And so you, your dad, was, weak. was your mom strong? Um, she, I won't, I won't say she was, she was strong, but she was, she kind of took control of the house, which made us, um, think that she was strong because we had took up her weakness. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it, she did have a, it was, it was very weak as far as, as with a, how a man should be, but it just was shown strong to us because that's the only strength that we knew. Uh, how about you, Marcus? Are you a weak man? Am I weak? <laughs> I, I I don't think that I'm, I'm weak. I still have problems, you know, with um Why you don't think that you're weak? Because I mean I, I work, I take care of myself. Um I try to work out my problems when I have them. Were you weak before? Did you have a weak father in the home? My dad wasn't there. He wasn't so you were raised just by your mom? Yeah. Just by your mom. And what was that like for you? Well, I didn't like it. You Why know, not? It because um, my dad wasn't there, and so my mom was, I think, pretty much unhappy with that kind of situation, you know, with him not being there. And so I think she pretty much took all that out on her children while she we did? were there. Yeah. She took it out on you in what way? Well, I mean, I look like my dad, like more so, I think, than other kids, and I was the oldest. Yeah, oh, so yeah. So I think that, you know, initially I got the brunt of that until she started to understand some things, you know. Did you resent her for that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Billy, Definitely. are you cold? It's cold in this theater, huh? I mean, it's. Oh. Yeah. So, are, were you raised by your mom and your dad, or just your mom? Just my mom. Just your mom. And did that affect your life in any way? Did affect your life in any way? Well, I think everything was all right until uh, initially I was raised by my grandfather and my grandmother, and everything seemed all right until I got uh, a little older into my uh, teenage years, and then. And then my mom, mom took over, and and she raised me from that that point. She took over, you know, taking care of me and everything. Yeah. And uh, and then you know problems kind of started for me right there. <laughs> what kind of problems? Um. My mom. I guess the thing is she. If, you know, if I had a mind of my own. She didn't like that at all. If I had if I had my own opinion about anything, she's mad at me for having my opinion. Yeah. Uh, especially if I caught her for you know if if I said anything that she didn't agree with, you know she's looking for my agreement with everything that she that she believes in. In in that way, you know, and if I and uh, and I guess that. You know, for a long time I wasn't able to really, for a long time I really didn't give my opinion or anything like that, and I think that kind of messed me up. Yeah. Was your mom like that, controlling? Um, kind of. But in a way, um, I, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> no, I, I'm What's your impression? Of, you you didn't have your father at home either, right? Um, my, my father was there, but he was enlisted in the Marine Corps, so I didn't really have that kind of father bond relationship with him and so your mom pretty much raised you so what's your impression of your mother right now or at then like at that before? time um back then i really didn't you know look at any wrong you know because that's the way i was raised so i thought that you know that's just how it was <laughs> <laughs> i did you know and so what's your impression now my impression now is i'm seeing how she really was and how was that um uh, how can I say? Um, not to be disrespectful, but she was like kind of sneaky, kind of. You know, it's like she would kind of say things 
that I don't know that kind of trying to push me to like kind of in in her direction kind of you know and try to and and opposite of give me an example what you mean well like for one you know she'll kind of talk about how my my dad was like kind of nothing and like that like what how my dad didn't amount to nothing you know and but when i look back in reality he did but just that because she pretty much i guess despised him i guess yeah let me ask you this before we go to break and when your mother would say that about your father what did that do to you if anything how did that make you feel I did. I just blew it off. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought that this lady don't know what she's talking about. You know, that she just yap at the mouth. So, <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. A lot of kids are not strong enough to do that. They kind of believe it after a while. They yeah. think that the dad don't care uh, uh, or is no good or don't love them. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Pat, that's a white man. You had the same problem. Were you raised by both parents? Uh, yeah, I was. You were raised by both parents. And did you go through the same thing that we're talking about here? Because 99.9.9.9% of black men are raised without fathers. And as a result of being raised without fathers, they have the, the nature, the spirit, the identity of the woman. They are very insecure. And the way that they take it on is because they resent this woman for her anger, her hostility. And when you hate anything, you take it on. But, Pat, we need to take a break. When we come back, we'll pick up with you. Back in a moment. Okay. Okay, we are back, and uh, we are from the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny, Rebuilding a Family by Rebuilding a Man. Right now, we are talking about the effects that uh, a mother can have on a child as a result of not having a father in the home, and that when black men began to realize this, and all men, then their lives are going to be able, uh, will begin to change. It's not going to change until we are able to forgive our parents for their weaknesses for being wrong and when we forgive them then God will forgive us and then we can get on it with life but until that happens it doesn't matter what the white man give you it doesn't matter what your so called leaders give you you can go to church until you're black and blue in the face you can shout and fall all under the bleachers whatever you call it (laughs) you can study that bible until you black and blue in the face you can speak in other tongues, tape recording, and all that junk. It's not going to change until you forgive. And if you don't believe me, look at your own life now. Everybody and their mama go to church. And the only person that's getting rich is the preacher. And it's a fact. We got to begin to deal with ourselves. Um, Pat, so did you come from the same environment or you had both parents? Yeah, I mean, you say you talk about the black man having this, but um, I'm sure it's a lot more prevalent in the black community. But... Uh, the same types of things go on in all the communities. I mean, all you know, all the people I grew up with, most of them either had you know, a lot of them had single parents. Uh, a lot of them had two parents, but the mother was very dominating, uh, like in my situation, and my dad was real weak, kind of in the background. When so you say weak, what do you mean by weak? Well, I would say by that uh, he didn't run the household. Number one, uh, he let my mom run the household, and kind of like whatever he saw was going on he didn't bring that to the forefront and make that the rule of the house. He let that stay in the background and let her kind of run everything. So basically, and seeing things that she would do and not correct her about it, uh, for instance, my mom would always be all over me, you know, too overprotectively, you know, get your coat kind of thing where you kind of go outside, <laughs> just being on your back. And he would not take her and remove her from my back. And so that's what I mean by being weak. No, oh, okay. Yeah. Were you afraid to speak up to your mom? Not at all. Not at, as a child, you weren't afraid. You wasn't afraid. I don't remember at any point, but if I, I don't remember being afraid at any point to talk to her now. Yeah. Were you afraid to speak up to your mother, Billy? Yeah. You were afraid. Why? Um, I mean, if if I ever spoke up, I, for, for one thing, I remember that I had some type of attachment to her. Uh, some type of, of mental mental attachment to her and I you know I wasn't I guess a total I wasn't enough of an individual you know I was trying to I was working on that but I wasn't and um, what she would do was uh, you know if anyway she would 
you know, for days or, you know, if, if I gave my real opinion about something and she didn't like it, she might not talk to me, to me for days or whatever, <laughs> look away from me, you know, every time she sees me. And, and That's cruel, man. <laughs> I know. How about you, Marky? Were you afraid to speak up to your mom? Um, I don't think afraid to speak up to her. I guess sometimes <laughs> I wouldn't tell her the truth about certain things. Why not? Um, as a kid, because, um, I don't know, I guess I thought because I would, like, hurt her or something, you know, she would kind of act like everything was so painful that, you know, she couldn't bear it and stuff. So if it was something that I thought that she couldn't handle, then I wouldn't tell her. But I, when I started growing up, it turned into not saying anything to just yelling and screaming all the time. Really? Yeah. Were you afraid to speak up to your mother? Um, at, at one point. Actually, I, I would say I was afraid, but I said I just didn't speak up out of respect. Oh, it's respectable not to speak up? No, no, no. <laughs> like, like, in other words, if... <laughs> She would say something to me, you know, that I knew I was in the wrong. I would just kind of accept it. Or if there was some stuff that was kind of that questionable. Well, you know, I don't know. It's just back then, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Back then, I, I had a young mind, so I was thinking that, like, well, I don't so want to say that. So you thought it was respecting your mother not to speak up and, t and speak the truth? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. And you came up with that idea on your own? Yeah. <laughs> really? And so how did it make you feel about yourself when you was giving out this false respect? Um, I wasn't really paying in no mind because um. just like I said before, if she was pretty much talking and saying something, I'll just kind of block it out and like, yeah, okay, whatever. Really? And so are you, were you, did you become like that with other people too? No. Just kind of block out everything? Um, to an extent, I say. Yeah. So you did? Yeah. To an extent though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How about extent. you, Clint? I know I had a problem. You know, my mother was very controlling and, but she looked sweet. If you saw my mother, you would love her. She goes to church. You think she's the most nice, you know, the sweetest woman in the world. Mm -hmm. But in the home, it's something different. Very controlling. Don't speak up. I'm the mom. Don't talk back kind of thing. So it would put a lot of fear in me. Mm -hmm. And then when you don't speak up, what they say is that's respect. But that's not respect. That's fear. Because fear, uh, respect doesn't come with fear. Respect is something to give naturally. Yeah. So I was afraid to speak up to her too, and I know a lot of guys are like that. You know, I might have had that, I said I didn't have any. I might have had that because I see later that I had problems sometimes speaking up with women or being fearful, yeah. some, some being fearful about women when they get on you like that. Maybe I just overrode it with a lot of anger. Because yeah. you get angry enough, you can speak up to anybody. One thing for sure, if you can't speak up to your mother, you can't speak up to any woman. Mm -hmm. Either you become very violent or you become very weak. It all begins, right? Everything that we are today, begins in that home. What we are is what they have created. We are just yeah. like them. And until we begin to know, you know, the Bible say the most powerful thing is, uh, that a person to do is to know yourself. Mm -hmm. When we began to pull away and know ourselves, then we began to see what went wrong. Right. And when you began to see what went wrong, then you're, you're able to overcome it. But that's the hardest thing in the world to do, to get people to really look at themselves. Mm -hmm. They want to quickly blame somebody else. They want to... Uh, 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 react and hate the world, but you gotta begin to look at yourself in order to overcome this stuff. Well, you, yeah. So you're asking like, are we weak? Are you, are you a weak man? I'm not weak now. I'm very strong now. And but up with the, the evidence of that. But up until the age of 37, I was very weak. And the evidence that I'm strong now. Now I'm weak before God. You know, I I don't see myself as being strong at all. I just that I'm strong before the world. Uh, I have perfect peace within me. Absolutely perfect peace. And it's been that way for uh, the last eight years. If not deviated, it's gotten better. Um, I don't have sex out of well. I, I can wait. I don't take advantage of women. I can wait. I can date the girl and treat her properly because I'm not so desperate that uh, I'm using sex to feel better. I, I, um, I'm able to see myself. You know, I look and see that I am a man that need God and I need to seek after him. I'm not afraid to face my challenges, take them on. I don't resent my challenges, I look forward to them because I know that my challenges are gonna make me strong. And I'm not afraid to speak up to other people. I don't care what they think, I don't give a damn what they think about me at all. I love the truth, you know, I wanna know about myself first and I'm not afraid to deal with the enemy at all. And now I don't, I'm not boasting, I don't think that I'm like all that. But it's just that I know that I've changed because I took a look at myself, I forgave my parents for not being proper, <coughs> you know, it's impossible to love God. It is absolutely impossible to find God and hate your earthly father. You gotta forgive your dad, whether he's strong or weak, whether he's good or bad.
so that you can finally overcome, you know, that situation. Well, the question I have is, how, how can you come to know if you hate your mom or your dad? How do you know it? Um, the, the first thing you have to do is start questioning yourself. You know, why do I react this way? Why am I so insecure? Why can't I speak up to my parents? Hmm. The average person can't tell their parents the truth. And they rationalize it by saying, oh, I have to be respectable. Or they know that if they tell their parents the truth, their parents are going to overreact. Because most parents hate the truth. They don't want to hear the truth about themselves. And we know that as children, so we don't tell them the truth. Uh, if you can't stand up to your woman, you're addicted to her. you got to have it. You know, if you're insecure on the inside, if you have anger, if you're emotional, all those things are signs of a, a weak man, a weak woman, too. You talked about being afraid of to speak up to your mom and all that, but you didn't say the dad yet. And I can recall being definitely afraid of my dad. And why were you afraid of him? Uh, I was afraid of the angry side of him. I was afraid that I would do something that would just set him on fire. And oh, it would yeah. be directed at me. Yeah. And I didn't want that. Yeah, a lot of dads are like that. They can't deal with their women, so they take it out on the children. That's true. You know, because true. Their, their mothers have screwed them up, too. So they are, they're just like a woman. Well, they say yeah. they make it like they're easygoing. And in public, they look easygoing. And around people, they look easygoing. But yeah. somebody's going to get the brunt of something they're holding back. And it goes down to the dog or the kid or, you know, or somebody <laughs> smaller than them. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how, did, how can we overcome all this and stuff? Tell me the first with your mom? No, with yourself. Yeah. How, how can you get better? Well, I think the first thing that you have to do is to forgive. Forgive your, your parents for what they've done and um, just, just tell them that you do forgive them and, and try to go on with your life. Try to go on? Well, you have to go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, and how, how do you know that that's true? How do you know you're not just being brainwashed again? How do you know that is true? Well, I know that, that the way that I have, have gone was not working. The only way um, that I've seen some inside of it is is when I done it. You know, when I stood up to my mom and and told her that what I that I, I forgive her for hating them for these reasons. And one thing I want to get clear about that too: you got to go and deal with your parents, your mother and your father. And when you go and deal with them, don't 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 ask them to forgive you. Just say, you know, I'm sorry for hating you. I realize now you couldn't help yourself. Uh, you were screwed up. Your mom did it to you, and and to your dad too. You say, you know. I'm sorry for hating you. And when you do that, as you are forgiving them, then God will forgive you. Yeah. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. But also, if I can say one thing, though, is that you also have to mean it. You can't just go and say, oh, yeah, I'll forgive you, fine, whatever. You know, I mean, yeah. you have to mean it. You have to be like, you know, I'm sorry, you know, for what I did. And, you know, just kind of, you can't be like, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, did you do that with your mom? Um, yes, I did. I just did that, like, uh, actually a short time ago. Oh, yeah, like, and, and what happened? Time. What did she say as a result of Um. She pretty much just kept the same way that she was. Yeah, she that's really another change. point I want to make. When you go and apologize to your parents for hating them because of the way that they are, do not, I repeat, do not expect them to say I'm sorry. Now, if they said, that is nice. But do not expect because what's going to happen, you're going to take that resentment there and you're going to walk away with it because you're expecting them to do it. Most parents, not all, but most are so prideful and they are so willful and they are so angry that they will send you to hell before they admit <laughs> that they're wrong. But you got to forgive them. You know, we meet every Sunday morning at 1030 and on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. for men only. Sunday mornings for everybody. You could get more of this by calling 1-800-411-BOND. 1-800-411-2663. Take care. <laughs> Good night, everybody. to stand up strong, take the truth about themselves, to understand what went wrong. I know we can find a way, I know we can find a way, I know we can find a way to stand up, stand up. Protect the family. <laughs>